welcome back to the channel. Today we have a special guest from here in Ecuador. Uh, without further ado, uh, Lorena, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, let me start. Um, thank you guys for having me today. Um, I feel like we're neighbors, just a part of the country away. I'm Lorana Hughes, and I currently live in Cuenca, Ecuador. We want to apologize because I thought it was Lorena. Lorana. It's Lorana, which has very interesting conversations. Uh, no matter whether you're English or Spanish speaking, Lorana means the frog. And um, oftentimes, once they realize I'm an American, it's like, no, 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 what's your name? And I say very calmly, Lorana. And they say, no, 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 what's your name? And I say, my mama don't, didn't speak no Spanish. My name is Lorana. I am not the frog but I am the frog and I do that in my best Spanish possible. And usually it makes friends because now in a city as big as this is, I have strangers. They're not strangers, they're my friends. They're my regular taxi drivers or people that I've met that now know me and I'll be somewhere walking and I'll hear, La Rana! I know they're talking to me. So yeah, it has been an interesting, um, it's an interesting conversation piece for here. It's one of those things where the people that I meet remember my name. And that is has been so cool that um, there's not many of the frogs that you meet. And uh, and so it's been an interesting just part of my journey of coming here and being La Rana in, uh, in Ecuador. Well, now I'm glad I said it wrong. So we've got the whole story. Yeah, that's the, the back story, <laughs> the rest of the story. For real, for real. So, Lorana, where are you from originally? Originally, I was born and raised in Northern California, East Bay in a town called Vallejo that's right outside of the San Francisco Bay Area, the Napa Valley. But I spent most of my adult life in the Deep South. I moved to Alabama as a young adult, uh, finished undergrad in Alabama, moved to Georgia, spent a lot of my life there. Did a short stint in New York City, which was fabulous, but quickly came back to the South. And the last nine years before I retired and left the States, I was in South Carolina. So I've spent, uh, except for that, uh, that detour to New York City, I've spent all of my adult life in the Deep South as a transplant, transplant California girl. And now I'm back on the Pacific Coast-ish. Uh, he's, re he's ready to say I'm from the South. So I'm from Georgia as well. <laughs> I'm uh, two hours I think it was like two hours away from Atlanta. I'm from Columbus. Okay. So I lived in Atlanta for a long time, but then gravitated to the Macon, um, Byron, and then the central Georgia, Milledgeville, Deep Step, Georgia area yeah. for a while as well. So I know exactly that area. Yeah. yeah. I just tell people now, yeah, I lived in the South, but I've moved farther South now, like South <laughs> America. <laughs> you know, I still live in the South. It's just South America now. So that's my internal joke. Um, that I share on people when I have the opportunity to. I still live in the South America. Mm -hmm. So what made you move or decide to move abroad? A couple of things. Um, about a year and a half ago, almost two years now, I decided to retire. I had people literally tell me, you too young to retire. And I said, show me the rule book. <laughs> show me. Um, I was 49 at the time and just made the choice that I was ready to move into the dream that I had been working towards. And that was, I want to live a life where I can do the things I'm passionate about, period. No qualifications. I want to do the stuff that's important to me. Like my life's important, my life energy. I don't know how much time I have on this planet. I want to do the things that feel good, that I'm passionate about. And I felt like the assignment that I was on was done. I was running a farm and a farm to table restaurant in South Carolina, loved it, um, was doing the work of how do we fix community, which is one of my passions. I had a bubble ball soccer field and a 20 foot sound stage and a campground where we did survival training. I was building tiny cabins and things like that, things that I really enjoyed. But I felt like it's not enough. This is not enough. I'm not living in the way that gives me the kind of freedom. And so um, I made the decision. It was a tough decision. When you leave things that you love for kind of an unknown, it was scary. But I made that decision. And then I said, self, self, huh. we're going to rest. Because one of the things you need to do is rest. And I said, my kids, mommy, what you going to do? I said, well, retired people do whatever the hell they want to do. That's what I'm going to do. I said, mommy, you, you, what, what? I said, I'm going to take a gap year. Isn't that what the young people do? 
I'm going to take a gap year. I'm going to rest. I'm going to find some new retirement hobbies. And then I'll decide in that year what I really want to do next and where I want to do that at. And so part of it was I started really dreaming again. Like, what do you want life to be like? What do you want it to feel like? I have some real clear non-negotiables. One, I want to be retired now. I'm not going to wait 10 or 15 years. I want to be able to be retired now. And I want that to be sustainable. Now, there's some caveats because you can have all of your time to yourself and be living on, on a street corner somewhere or in a tent. That was not my vision. I want it to be economically sustainable in a way that feels good to me. And that's subjective. Um, I lived in Northern California where we never got freeze, freezing weather. And we had one day out of the year where it was 90 and we had no humidity. I lived in the deep South as a farmer. I do not want any more summers where I got to be out there working hard, physically working hard in a hundred plus degrees with a hundred percent humidity. I don't want to be uncomfortable. I'm in the chapter of life where I choose not to be uncomfortable. I don't want to be hot. I don't want to be cold. I literally want to wear flip-flops and a sarong as many days in this next chapter of my life as I can. I want to be able to be in a place that feels like the least resistance for healing. Because healing is a progressive thing. It's not just the spiritual and the emotional healing. It's the physical stuff too. And I've done a lot of damage in 50 years to my body because I wasn't balanced. I wasn't healed in those areas. I want to go to the place that's the least resistance for healing. And those were the parameters I set. What would it take for my life to give me that? And I started looking. I started considering Central America. I started thinking about Mexico. That didn't feel real good to me. I started looking at Panama and Costa Rica, Honduras. Did some, plan some travel, plan some trips. I wanted to get some new hobbies under, you know, because you retired, you got time is a little different and you might need some new hobbies that fit into that lifestyle. So I did. I went to Honduras. I went to Utila and I got my scuba certification. So I'm going to give me some new hobbies. Uh, nothing's going to be in my way on land or sea. I can go explore it now. Only 60 feet down right now because, you know, <clears throat> I'm working up to some stuff. Uh, but I started looking at places that might give me the potential. I got grandchildren. I need to be able to get back and forth to the United States on a whim if I feel like it. Some places that appealed to me, Bali, appealed to me. The waters of Bali appeared to me. And I thought, girl, how difficult is that going to be if your grandson calls and say, Grandma Blanket, can you um, hop on a plane? Let's be real. Let's be real. At 49 years old, there's no social security check coming in. You know, I got to strategize having enough income to give me the freedom and that kind of juggling game. And I began to just explore, get on the Internet. I'm thorough with some stuff, Internet. And something came in my radar. You know, where can I go live comfortably on this much monthly budget? And Ecuador came on my radar and I don't even know what the search was. It probably was something like that. And I went, hmm, this is interesting. I don't know nothing about Ecuador, hmm, but it's on the equator. Hold up, balance. They get 12 hours of sunlight every day. Ooh, one or two degrees off, depending on what city, you might be right on it. And then life happened. I was, this is totally unrelated, but it connects. I was liquidating my farm and I had a whole bunch of Ryobi battery powered lawn care equipment. And I'm selling stuff cheap, you know, because I ain't trying to hold on to nothing. Convert, convert to cash money. <laughs> Let me get liquid, as liquid as I possibly can. I got a whole lot of money sitting on this dirt. Let me get liquid. I was selling muscadine vines right out the ground, out the ground, you know. And there was a young man on Facebook in my region. And he was a teenage, he was a 14-year-old boy, biracial, Puerto Rican. He brown. He's brown. And that caught my attention just because. And his story was, he's got a stepfather. And this, this gets personal from my experience. His stepfather was a black man who'd been raising him. And he was passionate because his stepfather wanted to adopt him before he got to be 18. And he said, I'm going to help him. But he went out and nobody would give him a job because he's 14 years old. And he said to his mother, I'll start a business. And what struck me that hit me in my value system was his mother said, I'll give you a loan. And she went and bought him a battery powered lawnmower. I said, first of all, this young man is willing to do the work to support this situation. That's a good thing. Shouldn't we support the good things? And his mother, instead of enabling him, empowered him. And in this article that I saw, he said, man, if I have some more lawnmowers, I got some friends now that want to come work with me. 
I'm going to raise this money to be able to help this situation. That in the value sense of things struck me. I said, I got a battery powered lawnmower here. I got a, 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 some, some weed trimmers. I got a brand new heavy duty hundred foot cord. I got some two gallon drinkers. Let me gather up some stuff. And I messaged his mother and said, would you mind if I gift this to him? She said, come on by the house. I loaded that stuff up and I went. And he said to me, yeah, now I got two. I got friends that'll come work with me and we have ways to now earn the money that we want. You're willing to work for what you want? I can support that value system. Your mother's trying to support you in a way that I can support that. This man has taken on a child that's not his responsibility. That's a volunteer role. I can support that. And I said, tell you what, I'll be on the lookout. Because sometimes you can find stuff more quicker than you can find money. And I said, I'll be on the lookout on Facebook. If anybody puts another one up there, I'm going to find it. And within a month, because magic happens, there was a lady. She's a little old lady, senior citizen. And she says, I got one. And she says, you're the first one to respond. Come get it. I drove over to Augusta, Georgia and picked up this lawnmower. And I told her the story. Why are you liquidating your farm? What you going to do next? I said, I don't know. I'm exploring some places. I'm taking a gap year. But Ecuador has come up on my radar. And she says, what? Ecuador? She says, we just came back. We've lived there as expats for seven years. But my husband had some health issues that required us to come back to the States, insurance, you know, life. And she says, and what you're talking about doing, your passion work, I got some people that sound, they doing the same talk as you. And guess where they are? I said, go on, tell me. Ecuador? She says, mm-hmm. I said, well, I'll connect with them. And a friendship has developed. We still have a friendship on Facebook and we talk and we share and I send her pictures and she has the nostalgic moments. That connection led me to Ecuador. And when I finally, in my exploration, got to Cuenca and felt like Cuenca was what felt good to me. It felt like it checked my boxes and started realizing that there were people like me already here. One of my friends now that's about 15 minutes out of town, he's got an eco village. He's moving towards the same direction of how do we heal our lives? How do we heal community? How do we heal society? They're my kind of people. And it was just like seeing all the things there. But I'm a researcher and I started looking. I said, this is too good to be true. How are these folk, how are these folk renting apartments for $300 a month? Something about, uh, I got to go see it myself. And I began looking at places that I wanted to go. Some of it in ignorance. I mean, honest ignorance. Oh, it would be so nice to live back on the Pacific coast. I was going to see my, 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 Manchala and Salinas and Puerto Lopez and my, I was going to go up the coast. I could be back on the Pacific coast, just nostalgic. And then I realized, girl, you don't want to be hot or humid. <laughs> No, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. So I quickly departed those places. I went and did some scuba diving in Puerto Lopez. I went to Salinas and looked around. Great places to visit. But I said, does this feel like where you want to live? Mm -mm. Went to Quito. I couldn't breathe. I got um, some um, uh, uh, chubby lady syndrome going on right now that I'm working on. But I realized my first year I had some commitments I wanted to keep. I'd be going back and forth. I can't acclimate this quick. I didn't like the way the city felt. I didn't like the way the city looked. It didn't feel good to me. And part of it was then coming into Cuenca. I got in at three o'clock in the morning and I rented a hostel right on the city square. And I woke up first thing in the morning to go get something to eat. And I walked out and there was a man standing right next to the, the, the modern Tranvia light rail that runs through town. And he was standing there with five goats. I'm a farmer. <laughs> I, my last vocation was I'm a farmer. That right there hit me like what? And I say, what is and I'm trying to take a low key picture because I ain't trying to be a tourist, but I am a tourist. And I'm, I am I got to understand. And I phone an Internet friend that I had met here and says, could you please explain to me why this is he selling the goats? They look like good milk goats. What is he doing? Ain't no for sale sign. What's that? She said, girl, give him 50 cents. He'll give you some milk. I said, for real? <laughs> I said, for real? But it looked like a town that felt beautiful. And what struck me was the old and the new working together. The indigenous people still in their indigenous wares with the foods that go back a long time. Intermingled with this light rail, which is like that epitome of modern modernity. This, 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 in this place where the streets are still the cobblestone, cobblestone streets and the architecture is still from the Spanish influence and the French influence and those that came and um, did their thing down here. And I said, this feels like what matches my life. And that was what I knew. 
And then life has it. One of the people I had met online agreed to host me. And I said, I don't know you that well. I don't know. Let me just be honest. I don't know if I feel comfortable hosting you hosting me in my house. So let me spend a couple of days getting acclimated to the city and deciding. And then I said, I'll come over for dinner. If that feels comfortable, I'll stay. How about that? This was honest. It felt comfortable enough for me to stay. And on the second day of that stay, they said, you know, the second floor condo just happened to come open. And I said, for real? Because I said, my purpose of my exploration, I spent a month exploring saying, you'll find where, where feels good and you'll know it when you get there. And then you can plan another trip and go back and found, house, found housing. And so they said, I said, how much is it? Said, okay, let me, let me wrap my head around that. She said, this unlock right now, go down there and look. And I came and looked, I took a video. I showed my daughter, I said, girl, <laughs> Let me tell you what these folks say this place costs. I don't understand how that works, but I'm not going to argue with it. I'm just going to believe them. And I went to sleep. And in the middle of the night, four o'clock in the morning, I woke up and said, fool, what you talking about? What you need to think about? If it feels good, how much do you waste on Instacart and DoorDash back home? For real, let's talk real numbers. Girl, you waste that much money in a month. What you got to lose? And, I, and I've dealt with some of the fears in life so that I could make those leaps without it causing me anxiety. Yeah, it's still scary. Girl, you don't speak the language. What you talking about? What you talking about? Yo, I fly Espanol. Them two years of high school Spanish in eighth and ninth grade. I literally came here and all I could say when I started my retirement, ah, eh, e o u el burro sabe más que tú. I said, girl, that ain't going to take you nowhere. That's going to get you into a fight. That's, oh, that's good for, but I thought, I got technology, you know, I do the best I can. And what's the worst case? It don't work and I have to go back to the United States. What's the worst thing that can happen? I got dangers there just like I got here. But I can shop on $20 here and be big balling in the food, the food arena, you know? I can, there's a whole lot of things that when I began to do the scale of life, my, my quality of life, and then there's some other parts, it's about, not being so far connected from that sense of connectedness with people and with earth that fits my value system to go travel and go to the virgin beaches and they serious about it because you know you got to hike in you can come see it but we don't want your garbage no 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 no, no. hike it in hike it in take the short hike or the long hike hike it in because that's respected to be in a country that says by constitutional law we cannot have gmos in this country we see that that could harm us in ways that we understand. I'm a farmer. We understand how it harms us. And so to come into a place that felt good, because part of it's the feel, part of it ain't logical. It feels good to me. But then I began to look at how this would support my goals in life. And that's to be free. To be free and be able to afford to do the things I want to do in life. And that it feel good to me that it feels like the place least resistant to healing. Healing is about what I'm going to do next. What's the most natural way I can heal my body? Food, food. And part of that has over and over again been reaffirmed, you know, where you say to yourself, girl, this was a good decision. I don't care what nobody else thinks. This was a good move on your part. And then the results of making that move uh, on that first trip, when I got up that morning, I said, what would it take for me to do this? And the downstairs neighbor says, I, I can communicate with the owner for you. They had a 15 minute conversation that I could follow, but I couldn't join in because my Spanish wasn't that good. And the man says, I'll read it to her and walked off. And I, <clears throat> um, is there an application? Do you need to check my income and my credit? And like there's deposits for utilities. He said, go get the man his money. <laughs> go get the man his money. I had brought several cards so that I could do that, you know, juggle money thing if I needed to, if something came down and I needed to juggle some money, just, you know, anticipatory preparedness. I did. And I said, well, um, but um, like utilities deposits, I said, girl, he give you a number. You just go to the Western Union and pay it. And he said to me, repeat this five times. You are not in America anymore. You are not in America anymore. You are not in America anymore. And I thought to myself, what would have happened if you hadn't dealt with your fears? The things and the walls you think it's going to take to be able to make this move. First of all, it's a whole lot cheaper. Sometimes it's a 10 to 1 conversion of what it costs in the United States versus what it costs here. The freedom that it gives me, I didn't even understand all the things that come off. Like, I know the anxiety when I go back to the States and be on Instacart trying to get groceries. 
and a dragon fruit is sixteen ninety nine a pound. And I message home or call home and say, what's the going price? Four for a dollar. Twenty five cents or sixteen ninety nine a pound. And it's ripe. It'll never get right there. And it's ripe. And I start thinking about that and saying that part of that is my life work, that if we just fix our fears, guilt, insecurity, however we frame it, but our fears, what kind of world opens up? And so for me, this has been living what I, you know, practice what you preach. It's does it work for me? Does me healing my fears open up the doors for me to then go do the things I want to do right now? I'm in the chapter of life where I want to do exactly what I want to do. And literally, if I get up today and I don't want to do anything, I chuckle with myself in here all by myself. Girl, guess that's what we're doing today. What you feel like doing, Lorana? Nothing. Guess what we're doing today? Nothing. You know, be happy about that. But then I also, on the days that I feel inspired to do the things that I'm passionate about. I've been doing a lot of writing recently. I went through about four or five days where I wrote 30 articles, try to work on some things and prepare for some other things that I want to do, but I can do it at a pace that lets me live a lifestyle that's life affirming. And that for me is priceless. And then to realize how cheap I could do it here, like it's a joke to me. People say, you, and I ask people, I did some business consulting on one trip back and I had business owners. I'm trying, what are you working for? I'm trying to get to my freedom. Okay, great. What does your freedom cost you? Well, unless I got six figures a year, I started laughing. They said, why are you laughing? I said, girl, you don't even know what your freedom costs. You work forever. You're going to be a slave to this hamster wheel forever because you don't even know what your freedom costs you. I know what my freedom costs me. I know what it costs, like for real, in real dollars and cents. I'm a numbers person. I came out of the accounting background. I'm a numbers person. I know what my freedom costs me. Don't we need to know those things if that's what we're working towards? And so coming here has been that game of numbers. It's a numbers game. You can either increase your income tenfold or go where your money is worth 10 times more. I chose the latter because I realized I could have it now. I can have it now. I could spend however many years I got left. I like to think I'm middle-aged. You know, I'm in that early 50 stage. Maybe I got 50 more years left. Let's be real. 30, 40, 45. You know, if I look at my grandmother's age, I got another 45. I can put it in real good if I, you know, if, if I keep at it. But like understanding that the choice of having the life you want for me could be fueled by me changing the proximity of where I was doing life. And even those people that still tell me, you can't have what you want. Yes, I can. I can have 70 to 75 degree weather every day. Mm -hmm. Lorana, no, you can't. Uh oh, yes, I can. I can have 12 hours of sunlight each and every day. The uh, sunrise and sunset cycles is about a 30 minute window difference throughout the year. I can. Mm -hmm. Sure can. And then all the other things that are the hidden. It's the energy of the river. It's the thing that's happening. It's the prophecy of the condor and the eagle that they're still holding to. It's that dynamic of change. It's people that are not so far off from center that don't have very far to get back to center. That's a whole lot of living this. This is like coming back to the 70s and a slower way of living, but still having high speed internet and light rail that I can take for 35 cents, you know? And it's, and it's real. And so part of my choice was about going where it felt good, going where I was able to be honest. I want to be here because this is how I choose to live. But I had to know how I choose to live first. And so taking the time to figure that out has been everything. Like being specific. I, how do I want my space to feel? I want to have luxurious space. I want to be comfortable. I want to be able to stretch out. I want to be able to have people come. I want to be able to do some stuff and not have to leave home or put shoes on to do it. And so part of that was crafting a life that worked for me and not having any boxes about what, well, it's got to be in the United States. Who says that? Who made that rule? I got a passport. You know, I got an opportunity to have a visa so I can stay if I want to. They didn't ask me for no income verification. They didn't ask if I had no insurance. They didn't ask me none of that coming here. I got my visa in December. Just simply having a degree gave me the opportunity to change the whole dynamic and the economics of my life. The tiny cabin that I sold when I retired, 
that was my full-time living. My bathroom's as big as that tiny cabin now. Talking about change. Mm -hmm. And part of this is about if I'm responsible for the life I live, the things that I can be responsible for, then it's my job to decide what it is I really want. Because until I know that, what am I looking for? You know, until you know that. And so part of that was, you said, why did I choose Ecuador? Because Ecuador fit. Ecuador fit into the life that I want to live and how I want life to feel every day in a real way. I want to be able to walk 30 paces down and go get a dollar's worth of eggs, a dollar's worth of cheese and two croissants. Because if I get five, I'll eat too many up at the same time. <laughs> or take my 25 cent and walk to the store like a little kid and get my ice cream. And that feels good to me. And when you can be anywhere in the whole wide world, I realize I need to be as specific about what I want. And doing that and overcoming the fears has opened up a whole new world that's better than I could have imagined. It was good. It was good enough for me to make the move. But then the extra, the cherry on top comes in. You know, it's being here for carnival and participating in all the foolishness that's going on right up my alley. I'm going to be ready next year, y'all. Not only am I going to be collecting, I'm taking the collection. Anybody want to support my water gun? And now I saw a one to do bubbles. I'm just up their game. I didn't see nobody sprinkling no bubbles, just that foam stuff. I'm going to get me some bubble guns and a mask. I'm going to be ready next year because I see how they do it in Cuenca. They play hard. I didn't know they know how to play like that, but that's up my alley. See that? Do they like to play real good? Because I like to play. When I'm not serious about some stuff, I'm trying to get it in. Do stuff you're passionate about with the rest of your time. Play, girl. Play hard. You've missed some playing in life. Play hard. I'm going to be ready for them next year. Those are the extras. Extras. I have a standing appointment. I got probably three standing appointments in my life right now. One of them is Frisbee Friday. At 12 o'clock on Friday, I am unavailable because I'm at Parque de la Madre. I have playing Frisbee with my friends. And like that becomes the seriousness of my life. That's the life that works for me. Everyone else got to find their own formula, but like finding a place that fits that. Are there other places in the world? Probably so. None of them came up on my radar, you know? And then to realize all the other things, the connectedness, my genea my DNA, I'm working with um, Donnie Austin who's working on a genealogy project. And then to come to find out, hot doggone it, we cousins. And doggone it, my kinfolk been here too, you know? And to re I didn't plan on none of that. You build an intentional communities, man, me too. <laughs> let's, let's talk. And you begin to find the other joys of being here. It's magic. It's magic. And I think magic is available for each one of us, but you got to figure out what you want and then just go find it. Have it be a non-negotiable. I'm going to live life this way or at least die trying. And you go out there and find those pieces that fit for you. And that's been the journey. And I'm so grateful um, for this country, for the people of this country who are gracious, more gracious to me than I know Americans would be to them if they came there. And I recognize that. And it has been that next layer of finding freedom in my life that um, I ain't going back to nothing else. You know, it raises the bar of expectation in my life on how life has got to feel. If it don't feel like this or better, y'all keep it, keep it. You know, yeah. So that's my real story. That's how I got to make up a real. Let, let me let me ask you a question of the places because you mentioned that you have visited a bunch of places in the country. Are there places that you're still trying to visit that you haven't so far? Yeah, because I said first thing is find what feels good now, but explore. Take the next couple of years, you know, part of buying land and doing those kind of things. I don't know enough about this. This is a whole different system. I bought land and developed land in, in, in the States, but this is a whole new game. <laughs> they, they do things differently. And I said, don't push yourself. And so part of it is being in a place also where travel is so affordable. I want to explore all kinds of places just because I'm nosy. There's some waterfalls I want to go see. Um, there's some other people that are doing other things that I want to go see what they're doing because I'm nosy, just because I want to know. You know, I ain't got no reason. I just want to know. I want to explore the places. I'm trying to work my stamina up so that I can go and really have a good time at Machu Picchu. Coming over the Cajas Mountains where we get up 10 to 14,000 feet. Every time I go there, I'm like, how's your breathing feeling? Oh, you're doing good, girl. You acclimating. Maybe Peru is, maybe you're ready for Peru, you know? But like, I don't know if this will be my forever home. And I don't have to lock myself into that. 
Because I said, I want to explore. I want to explore, but I needed somewhere that I could land and feel like home. Even while I'm searching to see if my forever home is somewhere else. I don't understand yet the land value cost versus the rental cost. It don't make sense to me. Land value is so much higher than the rent values. Economically, there's some reason for that. And I don't know it yet. I haven't quite put my finger. So there's more that I want to learn. I want to go see the other places because even though this works for me now, I'm not in a box where I have to stay here forever. It can work for as long as it works and then it can be time for something different. And so holding that, that I said, the next couple of years, I want to see where I may want to be, um, where I may want to buy some land and build. Intentional community building is one of my passions. So where do I want to maybe do some of that tinkering? You know, I'm a tinkerer. Um, but as a soft landing, coming into a place where I can walk in and have a place that feels like home and I can put roots down, develop relationships. That was important for me in making this move. Um, I am not in the point of life where I want to be moving every month. Mm -mm. I want I want to be able to chill and relax and do nothing. And if I want to do nothing for the next couple of months, all my stuff and all my toys are right here in my little playground. You know, my neighbors sometimes don't see me. Are you okay? Mm -hmm. I'm having a great time up here by myself, you know? So having that for me was about finding home. Even if it's just home for now, that that was okay too, that I don't have to be locked into that. So giving myself freedom to be here for as long as it feels good. And if something else feels better, I'm going, I'm going. Unless, you know, the universe sends me a personal message. God and the universe say, girl, you're supposed to stay here a little while longer. And then I'll consider that. But to be free to go where I want to be right now, I really enjoy being here in Cuenca. Yeah. Uh, I know one thing that we've learned since we've been here, because one of the things that I wanted to do first, talked about moving when we first moved, is maybe get a small pot of land. Because listen, I know that I want some chickens, uh, you know, I want my aquaponics set up and everything. Um, but one thing we've learned in that we're, we've been very fortunate is that we, we decided to rent long term first. Yeah. So we can see how things really operate. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the one thing that we definitely know is if if you're looking for deals from people who are targeting expats you won't get deals you absolutely not looking for where they're not looking for you right that's and, the and, truth and that's here too um in just looking um if you go through like an expat facilitator your rents are going to be 200 dollars a month more period off the bat day one um the gringo tax as it's called here in my community is real uh there is still some of that prejudice that's what it is. It's prejudice that there is an assumption of those coming from America or uh, Canada that they are rich. Now, that's relative because we are in an area where the average income is four hundred and fifty dollars a month. Even a fifteen hundred dollar budget is a lot. But that doesn't mean we rich like they think, you know, doesn't mean that we're not still living on fixed incomes, you know, or um, in a, in a, just a fiscally responsible way. And so I have found that for me, part of how I counter that, cause I want to be treated like a local. I, I, I live like a local, you know, I have friends that are in the expat community. They live in the area here that is well known as Gringolandia. Gringo is not the same kind of derogatory connotation oftentimes as it is back in the States. If you said that in the States, it would be like calling somebody the N word, you know? Here, it's a much more understood. And so there's an area of town that they call Gringolandia. And the restaurants are more expensive. I went to lunch yesterday at a Thai restaurant with a friend. Um, $10 for, you know, for an entree. You get out of there, it's about $13. I go eat at the Mercado. I have a couple of spots. The Mercado um, near Rotary Plaza, the man, top floor, bottom corner, fried chicken like an old lady in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. It's seasoned, it's crispy, fried chicken and fried fish. I go there. Why? Because it's $2 lunch and something just thrills my inner belly about having $2 lunches. I just, it just thrills me. It just, that is my thing. And part of it is the immersive experiences challenges me to use my Spanish. It lets me see how well I'm communicating. Fluency isn't an issue anymore for me that I really hit myself over the head for. Girl, you ain't got to be fluent. You just got to communicate effectively. 
If it takes sign language or some pointing and your translation thing to get words that you don't know and use the words you have, I need the green pepper. You know, not the hot one, the sweet one. It's picante. I know, but caliente is all I can get to mind. Dulce. Verde, dulce, uh, 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 caliente. You understand what I'm talking about? We got you. Great. I was effective. And I stopped, you know, just putting that judgment on myself and like riding the buses. I had one of the local, one of my neighbors say, you're not taking a taxi? I said, I don't like taking taxis. I mean, I do it if I'm short on time, but I take the buses, one, because I love swiping that car, that thing, 30 cent. 30 cent, bienvenidos. Woo. 30 cent, girl, you do it. You big for picnic today. You done took two buses today. But I told her the Move It app tells me every single stop. So when I hear the announcement that the buses do, uh, prox, proxima parada s, and it tells me the name. I'm learning my way around town. I'm learning the names of different communities in different areas. I'm sitting next to the little old lady, and we comparing how many grandchildren we got. And then I'm amazed that we can have these involved conversations with each other sitting on the bus. You got seven, girl. I got four. You know, and I'm using my Spanish. Oh, where do you live? Oh, I live in Capulis Pamba sector. Oh, what you doing today? I'm going to the Mercado. And we're having these conversations and I'm practicing my Spanish. And I'm making relationships. Because if I see her later, she will know. La Rana. <laughs> you know, there's not many Afro-Ecuadorians here, let alone Afro-expats. So I kind of stand out a little bit. Kind of stand out a little bit. And then they know my name is Lorana. That stands out a little bit more. And so it gives me the opportunity to really be immersed in the culture um, and avoid some of that gringo tax stuff. But it's okay. It's where it's not a bad thing. Those that need that and want that, it's available. Spending $10, uh, it was $12.50 when I got out of there. I went, girl, this was six lunches somewhere else, <laughs> you know, on the corner somewhere, which I like to do. I make lots of friends on the corner selling food and coming out of the food industry. He said, girl, you know good and well, they ain't got no DHEC standards that's infected that. And I eat it anyway. <laughs> you know, give me a chicken that's been sold from the street corner. <laughs> you know, I don't know how long they've been sitting out there, but somehow I don't get sick. And I think, mm, interesting, interesting. And so part of it is avoiding that thing. I don't want to be treated like that. And so the ways I avoid it is, well, if you act like that, you get treated like that sometimes when you act like a local. And when you have your fears and insecurities dealt with, because it happens occasionally, the taxi driver will want some extra when they drop you off and it looks like you live in large because your building looks like whoop, 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 whoop. And I say, Nope. <laughs> nope. You're not supposed to play me like that. I'm not going to be played. But I often see some of us too afraid to say that, too afraid to say, no, don't take advantage of me. I don't want to be taken advantage of. People take advantage of you everywhere, everywhere. I don't want to be taken advantage of. And so when it does happen, I feel emboldened to be able to say, no, I, I really ain't going to let you take, take advantage of me. I will get out this car if you don't turn that meter on. <laughs> oh, it's going to be $10 to take me home. Man. I know where I'm at and I know that it should cost me five fifty or six dollars to take me home. So now either you turn that meter on or I get out your car. Your choice. Ah. See, si, senora. And they turn the meter on, you know, and we have an understanding. Um, so it is real. It's a reality. But in avoiding that, making relationships with my neighbors, my friend knows I'm looking for land, my next door neighbor. Uh, they he's an attorney. His son is an attorney that works in real estate. He's the man that founded the, the neighborhood association for the, all of the boroughs in, in, in Cuenca and says, when you start looking, you come to us and we'll walk you through it so you don't get taken advantage of relationships. And so part of that is how I'm working to avoid that um, as much as possible because it's life, you know, a quarter here, 50 cents here. I know sometimes they get over on me just a little bit and it's okay. Um, and part of that was changed. I read an article early when I moved here and it was talking about not haggling with people. Is it 50 cent or 75 cent not haggling? And it said their perspective was, I pay it sometimes because for me it's insignificant, but this is how I can do, give charity with dignity. And that stuck for me that I've gotten a lot less, if I know they're not taking advantage of me outright, I paid a price. 
I don't need you to drop it another 25 cents. Mm -mm, mm -mm. And I think about that. This is. Mm -hmm. So I missed something about that. There's so I have water delivered, the you know, the five gallon jugs. Mm -hmm. I used to get two or three at a time. And three of them cost me four dollars and fifty cents. Right. So the guy, you know, I, I text him, he'll call me when he's downstairs. And when I come down there, he's got the water sitting out waiting for me. I bring my cart, he takes the old ones off, put the new ones on. So yeah. here's the thing. When I first started using the guy, you know, I would just pay him for, for the bottles and you know, gracias or whatever. Well, I started giving him like 50 cents, right? Because this, this is the way I think. It's not because he did anything special. It's because I, when I text him, I want him to come and deliver my water and, and not, you know, take his time or whatever. So I started doing that. And now whenever I text this guy, he doesn't even, he doesn't even text me back. He calls when he's downstairs. He's got everything ready. The first time I use him, he, he'd have to go to his truck, get the waters, come back. Now yeah. he's just he's sitting there on his phone waiting for me to come downstairs because yeah. he knows I'm going to either give him 25 or 50 cents extra. And he's like, gracias, senor, you know, see you next time, blah, blah, blah. And I feel like, you know, you do things like that, not because you're just trying to be, you know, big ball or anything like that. It's because I want to build relationships with people where, hey, I might need some water from yeah. this guy, but I have something to do later. I ain't got time to wait. And once he gets my text, he knows like, hey, oh, that's the guy that always gives me a tip. I'm going to hurry up and bring him the stuff and get out of there. And and that's like you're saying that it's not always about like, oh, just being a big tip or anything like that. Sometimes you just want to build relationships with people. Relationships is everything. I had that experience today with my gas guy. Um, fortunately here, we have water that we can drink, so we don't have to pour it in water. But my gas guy, two or three trucks run by. But Pedro's my guy. He's an older man with dignity. Always wants to carry it himself. No, 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 no. I'm a strong man. And he's got his belt on. And I watch for him. And he'll come by. And I'll be at my kitchen window sometimes. And I'll be, Pedro! And he'll come right back and stop. And it's like, it's a relationship. But here's what happened one day. He came in one day and I was replacing my gas. You know, we're talking about $3. We ain't talking about big spending. I don't want to walk it to the corner where it's $1.65. So I do the delivered gas, which is $3 for the tank. Um, and he was bringing one in. I, I got a, um, one of the heaters inside just in case I need it. And it was empty that particular time. And as he was bringing it upstairs, he says, thank you for remembering my name. Thank you for using my name. I almost went into tears because it was like that sincere gratitude. I don't know if he's had experiences with us gringos where we just, you know, assume you'd hired help and da 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 da. And you know, you know how we can act condescending, entitled. But it was the reality of something so simple in building a relationship. Every time he comes, he hugs me. Mi amiga, you've been gone. Where you been? I haven't seen you. I was traveling or the, and like this was today. I've been waiting. There's other trucks that come by. One Pedro, one Pedro. Nope, nope, nope. And I have a $3 sitting there. And so when he came by, it was later than he normally does, but I was glad because I was paying attention and I fly out. The, I, go, I go to my patio and he knows it's me <laughs> and he comes back. But it was that idea of something so simple in creating relationships is I know his name and I use it. And he was grateful. It's like that 25 cent, you see sincere gratitude that there was just an effort and intention of developing relationship. And that's some of the specialness, you know, that 25 cents or that 50 cents just to express gratitude. It's a token. It's a token. It's an appreciated token in the economics here, but it's a token of just kindness to each other. And I think that, isn't that what community is supposed to be like? Isn't that what it's supposed to feel like? Now. You like you said, you travel by bus. Do you have any concerns about being on the bus, whether it's within the city or you're traveling to another city? Because we travel on bus here within the city, but we really haven't traveled to another city by bus. My first experience here in Ecuador, I realized I don't ever want to drive here. <laughs> I don't. I, I. They all make it work together, but um, like I just don't want to. <laughs> Uh, that whole idea of being on a windy road in a big bus or a van and you being on the left side of the road and the rules are just very different. Like 
nah, girl, you ain't fit to try to learn all that. You know, the, the rules are real. And so part of that was being able to take advantage of the very interconnected bus system. It's affordable. It's convenient. There, it can, I've been to some far outreaching places so far, and I'm just amazed at the bus system. And one time I wanted to take a van back in because I didn't want to go all the way to Guayaquil to come back in. I was going down, down below Naranjal. I was going to find a shaman out in the middle of the long way, way, way out. And I come back and they say, just stand here. There's a van, there's van service. Get a man $5 and they'll put you on the next van. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's see how this works. It's true with that. <laughs> Within five minutes, here come a van and you hop on that Busetta and there you are. And I'm like, dang. I can get anywhere just about on $15. And part of it has been you learn to be cautious. But having traveled through areas of Central America and now South America, like it's the same kind of caution you do in America. Like you get on the bus in Atlanta. What you do? You got your purse all hanging out, your stuff all hanging out your purse, your phone in your hand or in your back pocket? No. I mean, you can, but like you just get got. Like that's what's going to happen to you. Someone is going to potentially take advantage of you and you got to own your part of that. Um, I don't put my backpack up top. You know, if I put my luggage on, I make sure I put it down there. I watch them to make sure I see it get on the bus and that thing gets closed down. I um, intentionally carry a shoulder strap bag that's got my zippers on the inside because it's always under my arm. I'm somewhere absent-minded, wandering around, looking up. My arm is always on it. So even if you grab the strap, I got my, my, my arm on the main portion of it. I got a photocopy of my passport. I'm not traveling with my original documents, you know, so that something gets, something happens and then I'm, I'm stuck somewhere. Um, um, I put my money in my vault. <laughs> I, I do the tuck in the vault kind of thing. I mean, you know, I practice those those kinds of things because like I get some coinage and put them coins in that little pocket in the front so that if I need to pull out something, I ain't pulling out that ATM money. You know, I've learned some of those things on how to maneuver like that. I know how to walk like, com like I'm confident, <laughs> walk like I belong here. And then the other part of this is being a brown woman in Ecuador, they don't know until they start talking to me and my Spanish runs out that I'm not Afro-Ecuadorian. They don't know that I don't belong here, that I'm not just a part of the culture. And so I think I'm less of a target than if I were my friends of the light of persuasion. And so part of that is being anticipating the kinds of risks, because this, this, risks are real everywhere. I do an assessment of what those risks are. And then because I'm prepared, that leaves me free to be carefree in my movement. You know, it lets me be able to go. Part of what I'm doing in these years is about exploring the different places of Ecuador. I can't do that in a plane. I get on a bus because I want to be able to see how far is it from Puerto Lopez to Quito? Ooh, that map don't look like it's that far. Some of those things that we know, the skewing of the map, it, it, my brain still get twisted. Like that should be a three hour drive, right? No girl, that's 12 hours. Oh, no, let me, let me, let me get my head together around that. And so part of it was, I just don't want to deal with it. And then the other part, that's the, the, the real logistics of this. When I asked people, what are the areas that I'm susceptible to being taken advantage of briberies and things like that? They say, drive and buy some property and start building something. If you're driving, you have the potential of being in the places where bribery could happen more easily. Mental note. Okay. All right. All right. How's, if, if you were driving and you got stopped, is your English under stress, I mean, your Spanish under stress going to be good enough for you to maneuver the situation? Girl, stop playing with yourself. Your brain be locked up. <laughs> you can't even come up with no English, let alone no Spanish. Uh, no comprendo. Nada. Nada, 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 nada. Mm -mm. Nope. Stop talking to me right now. My brain just been shut down, you know, especially you asking me for some money to do something that don't cost me no money. Uh-uh, uh-uh. We're about to have an issue. And so one of the ways that I can avoid that until I feel more confident is not driving. I can hire a private driver for $8 an hour. The, the farthest taxi ride to the other side of town, which is like 45 minutes, almost an hour away, is $8. I can hire an out of town driver for about $12 an hour to take me anywhere I want to go and bag. The cost of figuring out how, how to get a license down here and car and insurance. And mm -mm, I said, no. And so the buses have been so 
Wonderful. I use uh, Road to Rio oftentimes when I travel. Road to Rio lets me put in where I'm going and give me all the options. I can check out the different bus routes, which companies might be my preference. Um, I've learned my way around the bus terminals, like how to maneuver the bus terminal situation, you know, make sure you got your coinage to pay that turnstile to get into the the the, the bus parking area. Uh, make sure you got your coinage to get into the bathroom should you need to go, you know, just all of those kind of little things. Um, be weary of the travelers that may be scoping you out, you know, uh, through their children. That's a reality. And so just knowing that if you're going to give, have it on the surface. You know, I got one dollar and then they say, but you got more. I don't care what I have. I have one. Do you want it or not? You <laughs> know, I'm not just to open up my wallet in front of you. Mm -mm. It's too many of y'all around me. I saw four children and three of those around me. No, man, mm -mm. I ain't taking nothing. I ain't opening up nothing. I got a quarter that I'm willing to give you. Or I'll buy some sweet treats or I'll buy some juice or some fruit for the children if that's what I choose to do. And then I learn no gracias, no gracias. Mm -mm, I don't care what it is. No gracias, no gracias. So for me, economical, convenient, but it also serves my purpose of getting to see the areas of Ecuador that I may want to come back and explore further for, you know, long time, um, long time living. So it serves that purpose um, and it's entertaining. Let me just tell you. One of the best entertainments is watching at those stops, those vendors come and get on and off the bus selling goodies. And to realize the diversity of goodies you might be able to find from socks to headphones to fruit in a cup to hot meal, seco de pollo to no telling what. And then the game for me is, are they going, how far out of town are we going to roll before they get off the bus? And is the driver going to actually stop to let them off the bus or they're going to just be hopping off when it slows down? I'd be waiting. I said, this is the best entertainment I can get. Spend you eight dollars and go somewhere just for the entertainment and the snacks. Like for real, that's real. That's that's my real answer. It's entertainment, and and so part of that is also part of the culture. But the amazement that they have this interconnected system. You know, you go to Guayaquil's bus terminal, and it's three times as big as the as the airport on any given day, and the buses are coming and going, hundreds of them, and it just works. And so that is one of the things that this country gives me the opportunity to travel effortlessly. I ain't got to think about blowing a hundred dollars and go spend a weekend somewhere. I hop on the bus for fifteen dollars and go get me a hostel for a little bit of something, something, and get, can go eat and, and explore, and and then get on the bus and go back home, and be able to do that with relative comfort. The people are peaceful. They're passive. They're very um, meek, uh, not confrontational. I've been fortunate that we haven't had any of those other kind of things. Nobody's commandeered our bus or done those kinds of things. But um, it's just watching for those kinds of dangers because that could happen anywhere. And I don't limit myself. Well, I'm not going to do it here because it could happen. Well, go back home. <laughs> and it could happen. Matter of fact, it happens more often that I see it happening here. And so part of that is use wisdom. But I'm not letting fear stand in the way of the potential rewards. And um, I love it. Well, speaking on the um, the crime issue, uh, how are you feeling about that in recent months and this past year or so um, with the crime situation and then the crisis kind of thing that happened in the and curfew then, situation think, that's going on now and everything? And then we did the USA Today. Oh, yeah. we talked. Yeah, yeah. That's right. We did. Yeah. We talked yeah. to the guy in the article. Yeah. Um, I think if you want change, it's necessary. Like that's my take. It's necessary. Do you want it fixed? If you want it fixed, those who don't want it fixed have a vested interest in preventing you from fixing it. And I think that's part of what's happening. We have this new president. He's part of the global wave of these new young leaders that are saying, let's stop talking about it. Let's just do it. Let's just do it. Right. And I think that when we want change, we have to accept the messiness that happens when you are changing that paradigm. If the people want that to be um, controlled, then you have to understand that they're not going to willingly give up. Okay, we're not going to run them through here, even though y'all got the port and we're trying to move stuff over to Europe and other places. You know, we're just going to give it to you. That's not realistic. And so I think that what I see feels like it's being handled in a way that's respectful of the threat to people and trying to balance that out. 
which I appreciate. Let us know what's going on. Try to be honest about what's going on so we understand the personal threat potential and we can make preparations for that. Go home. Well, here's what we want you to do. We know that this is to fight us. <laughs> we have called them out openly. They want to fight. So what we need you to do is go home because we're ready for the fight. We're going to do these things and be able to call the military in because we need to call in our reinforcements. We're going to go both internally and externally because we know some of the stuff's internally. We're going to go there too. But we need you to go home and be out the way so that you're not in the crossfire. That makes sense to me. And so when I come with my American mindfulness, I think, man, could we have gotten this to fly in the United States? No, 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 no. But, what, mm -mm, but I see the people standing on the side of right. I see people saying, you're embarrassment to our country. This is not how we do. God, please come in and help this situation. This is not us. We are not this kind of violent people. I see the people supporting the change for the positive and saying, you want us to shut it down? We will shut it down at sundown and go home. <laughs> you got it. Take the streets. Do what you need to do. Let us know when we can come back out again when it's safe. And for me, it had negligible impact on my life. One, I ain't out after midnight. You know, I'm trying to be a senior citizen. I'm practicing to be a senior citizen. I'm at home. I'm at home. You're out after 730. I'm at home. Come see me over here. Um, but we saw some troops out first couple of days, first week you'd see gatherings. But it's a different approach that when I see even groups of police or military, it's not an aggressive. It's not a harassment. Um, they're not harassing the children for playing in the plaza. They're not harassing people for sleeping, taking a nap in the park. They're, it's not that kind of confrontation. And this is a culture where security is something you always see. So seeing people with guns is nothing new. You know, you go to the bank or you go to some of the stores and they got security out there and that's just kind of normal and not in a way that feels threatening. And so for me, it's if we want change, then that's what has to happen. And I think they're leading this globally to be able to say, we're just going to do it. Yep, it's going to be a little messy. Mm -hmm. There are going to be some casualties in this. That's the reality. Um, but when I look at this in comparison, I tell people, I didn't hear about them shooting up no churches, no schools, no malls, not the football game or the soccer games. That's not stuff that's part of it. When somebody is caught stealing, <laughs> you see the videos where they go to their house. They drag them outside and they whoop their tail. <laughs> and they see yeah. there's signs posted in some places that say, if you come up in here and you violate the values of this community, we just gonna whoop you. We just gonna whoop you. They took his, they took it, I think he had pickpocketed somebody on his motorcycle, you know. They took the motorcycle, dragged it out, and stomped it, and then whooped his behind. I thought, hmm, well, that's a good idea. And don't that make sense? Like, we cool with this. I'm even mad. I'm like, Loki, high five, not for violence. I'm not standing for violence. Like, can we find other ways? But like, from a community standpoint, no, we're going to handle you. Do not come into our neighborhood and steal purses off our little old ladies. Because if you do, we're coming for you. Like, in a 1970s kind of mindset, that makes sense to me. If you want to fix those problems, what you going to do, sit at home and talk about it? No, go get them. And what the president basically said in Lorana's translation of it was, um, we're coming for you. No, no, we won't wait for you to come to us. We're coming for you. And if you look at the numbers, if you look at the numbers of what's been happening, I'm talking about tons and tons of stuff they've been rounding up. The gun count, the bullet count, the drug count, the money count, the they're doing something. Do I see it in my area? Nope. Nope. Life is normal. Life is regular for me. I'm grateful that their numbers are adding up and still my life is still normal. I can still take that $20 bill and come back with a week's worth of groceries. Like, so yeah, it's bad. That's, it's sad. It's sad that anyone has to be hurt in the process and those who will be the casualties, the DA, um, the candidate for president, it's, it's sad. But it's sad no matter where it's happening. This is not a perfect country. But doggone it, there's a whole lot of things going on that are going right. And I think demanding change and being willing to do the hard stuff is where we're going to, as societies all around the world, going to have to do. We're going to have to say, you know what? It's going to be a little messy. That's what's happening over in Africa right now. 
economics is going to be a little funky, but what we're, what we're moving towards is freedom for you as people to be able to live your lives in ways that are thriving. So we're going to get rid of these CFA Franks and it's going to be a little <laughs> touch and go. They might want to come fight us. You know, <laughs> they might want to fight back. When paradigms shift, that's what happens. If we avoid it, then we only delay the inevitable. We only delay the inevitable. It's going to happen at some point. And what this president has said is, let's just go on and do it. Let's just go on and do it. And so for me, it is a symbol of change and transformation. And that's just what goes with it. It's a little messy, but then it gets better. And then it gets so much better. And that's what I'm hopeful for, that it will get better. And then it will get so much better that this will, people, people will globally understand this was the best thing. This was the best move to get us to that better place. It was necessary. So that's my take. I know it's a little bit different than other people, but that's my take. It's necessary if we want the change that comes with it and we want the results. So tell us about the projects that you're working on. I know that you're passionate about, you know, yeah. so please share with us. Oh my gosh. So, you know, talking about doing what you want to do, part of my work, the passion work, um, even when folks not paying me has been, how do we fix community and how do we put it all together? And in that work, um, the intentional community movement struck a chord with me. Can't fix all of community at one time, but we can fix it one community at a time. And sometimes it's easier to create the new than try to fix the old. And I've worked in a variety of ways. This is how I got into farming, pieces of community that need to be moving for us to do that. And part of my desire is to put all those pieces together. Let's build communities that work in a new paradigm kind of way, um, physically, mentally, spiritually, economically, fin uh, uh, financially. Um, let's do that. And so towards that end, it was, where do you start? And part of that was my formula for change is about healing. If we do that first, then it gives us the capacity to work together better. If I'm working on my ego stuff and so are you, we don't sit at these tables and have kissing contests. Let's just be real. It takes too much energy. And so part of that formula says we got to teach tools. Part of my the body of the collective body of my work has been um, the convertible community concept and social tech, the tools that we need to be able to do that. And I said, I want to be able to teach people these tools. Um, it's uh, my search has been what's the quickest, fastest way we can help people learn how to think differently and think in ways that heal them. And so towards that end, because economically it's feasible here, um, part of what I've developed here is the International Welcome Center that gives me a space where I can still wear flip-flops and a sarong. So this is keeps my values in order um, that lets me bring people here to heal. It's called the International Welcome Center, but the website is Global Underground Railroad, and that's, that's intentional. It's when you realize that the old paradigm is what's keeping you in bondage a new form of slavery and you need to leave and move to a new paradigm, but you ain't got the right tools and you don't even know really where you're going. You ain't got no maps in the, it's where do you go first? Well, the International Welcome Center, you know, there's some people that right now realize I got to leave that old paradigm. I know it's dying, but it ain't dead yet. I got to go now for, for coming from the African-American experience. That makes sense to us. There were people that needed to leave that current form of bondage before the old paradigm died completely visibly. It's dying. And there were those that said, we got to go, but like, um, can we do it, all of it, you know, out in the open? Nope. And they created the Underground Railroad. They were limited by geography then. We're not limited anymore. But the bondage is the same. There's some people that life, living that American way, is bondage. And for those that need to leave, the very first thing you need is rest and retooling. And so this gives me the opportunity to do that. Um, we have eight bedrooms and eight bathrooms here that allow for me to be able to bring visitors. The point of entry is our healing vacation retreats. For those that only got a little vacation money and they know they need healing, but don't want to compromise the vacation, come. Come and explore the rich heritage that we can do here, but come and do that rest, different kind of rest, but come do that rest and let us give you tools and coach you through some of the, whatever the biggest boulders in your life are. Because I believe that trauma is the addiction and we've got to work on healing that. And then part of it also is, but community is about community. And part of what I'm doing is building an intentional community here, co-housing space, a community of people who feel called 
to lead in preparing the leaders for this new paradigm. And so we've got some co-housing space. And then we've got some initiative work. Um, the training that I do can be short term, but we also do leadership training, which is much more in depth and part of building community. Like it makes sense to me to build it in community. And so we have space for those that want to take a leadership sabbatical to come and stay anywhere from one month to six months and they can participate in our leadership training. But one of the things that I'm super excited about, because if you get strategic is where do you start? And one of the places that I felt like was a good investment was to start with women. Whole lot of reasons, but part of it is science says that the equal and opposite force is what brings us back to balance. It's the pendulum swing. If you can see a pendulum swinging, it's the equal and opposite force. Part of my assessment is that our American culture is really living on the extreme edge of the masculine, the unhealed part of masculine energy. It's not men specifically, but it's masculine energy and globally. The spiritual leaders, they understand that it's the feminine energy that pulls us back into balance. You know, you got to balance those scales. And I thought women are a really good investment. What if women healed together? And towards that end, um, it's a good will to help people do that if they really want to. And we found some funding. We found a funder that has given us $30,000 to offset the cost of women coming and learning how to heal. And I thought, but part of my work is collapsonomics. When is the social paradigm going to shift in a major way? And it's great to have tools for healing, but we need to be practical. You need a little more than just that. Um, I've done about 15 years of survival training. I use some of the models that I think are brilliant system models for planning how to be prepared for crisis. And so what we've developed in partnership with Carawa Works is a two-week village builders retreat. The first week is the rest and relaxation of our healing vacation retreat and the equipping. But the second week is hardcore work. We literally teach you the skills to protect yourself from heat, cold, injury, illness, thirst, and hunger, and do it with some solar because we got the sun. We teach them hands-on tools of how to build a crisis village, how to power it up with solar, and then how to use the healing tools, which give you tools for conflict resolution and emotional intelligence building, how to use that as we learn how to work together, because we feel like we want to send these teams of people home to be much better first responders when anything comes up. If it's crisis that affects us mentally and emotionally, are you prepared? Well, first off, are you doing the work so that you're a better, um, a, a, a better leader in that? You're not so triggered. You're not so much in fear. If crisis happens, it's hard to overcome your fears in the midst of crisis. Coming and having hands-on experiences where you've done it, and it's a framework that's not a rigid. It gives you tools so that you find what resources you have there. You understand what your shelter needs to protect you for. And now you find the tools and resources you have in your situation and you can extrapolate some solutions. And when you've done it, you know you can do it again. You might be a little scared, but you're not terrified to the point of paralysis. And so this funding will let us offset part of the costs um, the way the funding is tied, you must bring a partner because we want you to go home with a, with a healing support network already built in. Sometimes when you start healing and nobody else is healing around you, it's hard and we don't want to do that. And so a woman must apply, um, but anyone else can come with you. Husband, brother, sister, friend, we don't care who it is. Someone that's going to be your support team. The cost of the two weeks is all inclusive except for airfare. We pick you up at the airport. All of your transfers, meals, all the tools and equipment you need are already here. All the excursions are included. The cost for the two weeks is $4,100 per person. That includes all of your instruction, the training, the coaching, everything. The scholarship allows up to $5,050 of that to be offset per team. And so we have funding to be able to provide for 12 teams this year. The sweet spot for us size-wise is groups of four teams. We have the first one scheduled for April 9th. This is one of those pools that, again, doesn't have us uh, uh, stressing. It's use it or lose it, but it costs us nothing if it's not used. We want to use it because money on the table is money on the table. We've set our prices to be sustainable, but it's goodwill to help people do what they want to do anyway. And so we are specifically looking for the shifters and pioneers in our society. Women that, one, know they need it but also that may feel called to have a role in helping the communities change in their community. 
And so I'm really excited about it. Um, I'm the, 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 the hub for all of some of the connections is the nowastedtime.com website, but they can go directly to the woman heal together. And it's woman W O M A N. And that's important because I ain't fixing to heal for you. I got my own stuff. But if you commit to healing and we commit to doing this healing journey together, we go further. So it's womanhealtogether.com. They can go find information there in the applications. And our application is about getting to know you, not about qualifying you. We want people to take advantage of this. We don't fix it all. You got to have a passport. You got to have some airplane money. We suggest you have a little bit of spending money because chocolate and Panama hats like you come and you might as well. But we're excited because this is other people saying, I'm willing to invest in us beginning to try some new solutions because what we got is not working quite as well as we'd like for it to work. It's not working as fast enough. And part of this is about what's the quickest, fastest way we can get us going in the opposite direction. And so it's work that I'm passionate about because I think we heal community by healing people. When you start doing your healing, you become less damaging to everyone you come in contact with. And that's helping. And then as you grow in your healing journey and get connected with your passions, you begin giving the world the best of you. Like in a real sense, every day. And that I'm passionate about. Like I retire to be able to do just that. When I wake up in the morning and say, what is it you want to do? It's this. And so I got a whole lot of square footage here <laughs> um, for those who really want healing. We've done some of the work of making it as economical as we can and finding others to help and pay the cost. But they say, you got to be willing to invest in you first. If you ain't willing to invest nothing in you, don't ask me to, because I ain't responsible for you. All my kids are grown. I'm a grandmother. I ain't responsible for nobody. Play and fun and snacks is what I'm responsible for now. That's it. And so part of this is making sure that what I do aligns with my values too. This is sustainable value-based living. It has to be real for me. And part of it is, if you're not willing to invest in you, that's the give and take of community, then why should I? And I'm real honest about that. Why should I? Why should I go out and ask funders to offset 60 some percent of your cost to come get healing that's for you? And so we expect them to come to the table with that. It ain't a solution for everyone because it still costs about $1,500 per person for the two weeks. But I know what it costs to go to Disneyland. Hmm. And if you're willing to pay for that and you need healing, then I'm okay with you not having it if you're not willing to realign your resources to pay for what you need. Grown folks need to pay for what they need. Part of this is it's goodwill for me to help you. Um, it's goodwill for me to know some really cool places to take you and let you experience what mind, body, and soul healing feels like. We got world-class spas here. And they tell you all the minerals, the gold, and the silver, and the zinc, and the copper, and all this stuff that's good for you. Come play in the mud with me. Come do some of those things. But at the end of the day, it's about healing. It's about helping people get free in real ways, emotionally, so that they can then get physically free to go do the things that they truly are passionate about, because that's the best contribution we can give to, to the world. So I'm passionate about this Woman Heal Together initiative. I'm passionate that we've got funders that are willing to say, we'll write the check. And they're serious about $30,000 is no change, especially down in Ecuador, it's no change. And so for others to begin to see the relevance of this, to say, we do vacation because that buys some emotional freedom to do the hard work of healing, to get some rest so that they can weather that storm. And so we're grateful. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful to be in a place that lets me do this without the stress of you got to you got to hurry and get somebody in here. You got to. No, nah, I want the right people to come. If you want healing, reach out. We'll figure out um, our healing vacation retreats. We use alternative commerce. If you can't afford it all, there's a certain amount that you have to pay in cash because that's real goodwill and a smile does not work for everything. But there's a good portion of our healing vacation retreat that we barter. There's some caveats. It's got to be something we want. It's got to be a win-win. And you got to negotiate and give us a proposal on what you have to give from your passion that is something that we want or that you think we need. And I have a right to say no if I don't want it or don't need it. But we try to put things in place where we can be as accommodating as we can if someone wants healing. And then the other part of that is I'm working on creating a platform because I don't like the idea of hoarding healing. And so one of the decisions I've made recently is that part of the healing tools, the basic healing tools, we're creating a platform where individuals can go find that for free. 
doesn't mean I can do a whole lot of intensive work with you. It just depends on my time and energy and desire. But we want people, if they want to have these tools, to have access. So in the days and weeks to come, I'm working on getting the content there. Um, I believe in raggedy podcast productions because <clears throat> time, energy. If I got to do a whole lot of production, oftentimes it's not. People laugh at me and I tell them I don't care. If the message isn't more important than production, then skip it. You know, skip it. But trying to get that content put up where if people want healing and they want to be able to experience these tools, they can just go online. It's probably going to be on YouTube where they can just go online and take advantage of that. But if they want intensive involvement, we've got a space for them to come. If they want to get some healing and then come take a respite a month, two months, six months is easy on a on just a, a visa and an extension then we've got space and we want to make that available for those who realize they need to leave the, the old paradigm now. Um, they can find that and more information on either the No Wasted Time, the Woman Healed Together, or the Global Underground Railroad.com site. Um, we we want to make it available. Um, and so giving me a platform to even share that, I want to thank you because that's part of how the great blind works in real life, you know, and it's going back to those old ways of sharing information. Um, those who have participated, if it's working for you, share it, share it. Let's not hoard healing from people. Let's not hoard freedom from people. And, um, that I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about. Thank you so much, Lorana. It You're has welcome. been awesome talking with you. Cause I see all your, you know, your videos you put up on YouTube. I mean, not on YouTube, on Facebook, when you were on the bus, I was like, oh my God, she is really traveling. I saw you when you was <laughs> traveling back and forth, when you went to see your grandson, he was a little, he was a pilot for a minute. Yes. Pilot in the plane. Mm -hmm. And that was so nice. I mean, I've never been in the cockpit ever. How many times we've been on the plane? They've never offered us. Cause you don't have no little kids. Get to grandparent status and it opens up a whole new door of possibilities. Mm-hmm. I'm like a little kid with him. I'm like, boy, you opened some doors for me. Yes, yes. For sure. No, yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you for letting me share um, some things that I'm super passionate about. I'm super passionate about uh, expat living right now. I'm super passionate about the work that I do. Um, so thank you for having a platform and letting me share that with you guys and your audience. Thank you. Uh, well, everyone, uh, make sure that all of the relevant links that Lorana was mentioning will be in the description. So please check those out, see what she's talking about, enjoy her passion as much as she does. Um, and if you need healing, that's right. please sign up. That's right. Um, yeah, for any reason you need to get in contact with her and you can't, you can contact us. We'll try to make it happen. But like I said, we'll leave everything relevant in the description. And Lorana, thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate it. Um, My pleasure. Yeah. We will be back soon with a lot more. Yeah.